Yeah. Yeah. And another con, yeah. And so how are you going? I'm good, yeah. Um, yes. Long weekend in Melbourne. Uh, I don't watch the footy, but everyone was excited. I played board games instead. <laughs> Some nerdy. Uh, uh, you're in the right audience. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, kind of finishing up all the last bits and pieces on Empire of the Damned and starting work on writing book three. So yeah, I'm kind of in the in the drafting cave right now, which is always an interesting place to be after so long off. It's kind of weird. You do a big block of work writing and then a big block of work editing. So I'm kind of getting back into the writing every day. So that's wow. Cool. You're in the zone. I love it. And I was, I was going to say who you were supporting, but we'll, we'll skip right over the AFL grand final. Yeah, I'm more excited uh, about NRL today. <laughs> I mean, I'm from WA, so in theory, I should be a, a Dockers fan. My dad is a Dockers fan. Uh, he played <laughs> football for Fremantle, but yeah, no, I know, I know virtually nothing about football. <laughs> you fit in right well because I remember a lot of times I talk about football, NRL football, and people just look at me and I'm like, sorry, wrong audience. Yes, my team's not playing today, but very excited yeah, for Penrith. Sure. <laughs> Any kind of supporters? <laughs> like NRL down here in Victoria is, uh, you just don't hear about it. It's quite weird how that wow. division on state lines works. Like AFL down here is huge and the NRL is, I mean, I'm sure there are people out there yeah, in Victoria yeah. who are into it, but yeah, you just don't hear about it anywhere near as much as you guys. Wow. Unless it's the Melbourne Storm, that's probably as far as it goes down in Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> Have we only got one team? Yeah, you only have one team. There's only okay. one team in the NRL, so <laughs> it's not like AFL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I respect the sport. Yes, but um, look, moving moving into topics. So, writing and reading. Obviously, we are very excited to have you. But a lot of fans here who would love to know how Jay Kristoff got into writing. So, I am given to understand that once upon a time you were a musician. You worked in advertising. You've done yeah. quite a few things. But what was the trigger for you to pick up the pen and write? What ended up being your debut novel? Uh, I mean, I had always kind of written for fun. Um, and it was, yeah, I also did it for a job. So when I was working in advertising, I was part of the creative department, which meant I was basically writing TV commercials and writing um, print ads. So I kind of wrote for a living. Um, but, you know, the difficulty with advertising is you're not writing. You, you're writing television scripts. You're trying to convince people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have. You're writing, you know, you're writing ads for Vegemite and Ford and whatever else. So. Uh, after a few years in that industry, I kind of I got sick of not having kind of creative control over my output. The thing about being a creative in an ad agency is you could write the best script that you've ever written, mm-hmm. and then you have to you have to run it through a gauntlet of internal stakeholders and then clients and then market research. And the I, you know, the chances of a good ad getting through that gauntlet are pretty slim. So you're kind of watching your babies get killed like your creative babies uh, not your actual babies kind of watching your darlings get killed over and over again it gets pretty frustrating so i wanted to write something that was entirely mine um and i was also kind of spending a lot of time playing video games and i realized that i had nothing to show for my free time like i would get home and sit down in front of a computer and click away for three hours and then that was kind of it so i, I wanted to spend my free time more productively yeah so mm. I just started writing a chapter one day at work. Uh, I had an idea for a scene and that scene became a chapter. And then over the course of the next 18 months, it slowly became a book. I didn't tell anyone that I was working on it. I didn't even tell my wife because I thought it was kind of silly and I didn't know whether I'd even finish it or not. I had no idea what I was doing. I just kind of bumbled my way through it. Uh, And that first book was terrible because most books that you bumble your way through with no plan are bad, but it got me into the habit of writing every day and it made me fall in love with the process. And like I said, it, it gave me the creative freedom that I wasn't necessarily getting in my day job. So mm. and when it came through, when I finished that first book and it came time to write the next one, I was a little more methodical. I kind of planned it out a little bit better. And um, yeah, that, that was ended up being my debut novel. So that was... That storm Dancer. Yeah, it was like... Oh, 14 years ago or something, I think. Yeah, 2013? 2012 it came out, but I, yeah. I got my literary agent in 2010. Wow. Yeah, so I don't know it's, the year before. It's a marathon, not a sprint. I loved how you described <laughs> advertising before because well, I'm sorry, but that sounds remarkably like publishing. 
I couldn't tell the difference. Like you've got your you've got your baby, you want it to go through publishing, it's going through a gauntlet of editors, and then or or agents, query letters, and then bang, bang, bang until you land yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, advertising is even worse because you know, <laughs> um, I mean, at least when you're dealing with publishing, mm. everyone you're dealing with along the chain is ostensibly a professional they're involved in the publishing industry whereas mm. advertising you're you're throwing your you have these thing called focus groups yep. where you basically get a bunch of randoms in on like a wednesday night after work and they get a free cup of coffee and some biscuits and the, your ideas get thrown at them and they tell you all the things that are wrong with them they give you the kind of their initial gut reactions and it's really frustrating. That's um, cringe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's not a lot of fun. It was it was a cool industry for a long time. It was a great job to have, but I'm glad that I don't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I I get that. Like publishing is tough enough, you know, and especially um, morale wise as well. <laughs> yeah, it can yeah, be. Yeah, for I, sure. I can get that. So, so the uh, the Storm Dancer uh, was your your debut. Um, that was a duology. Is that correct? Um, yeah, like, that was a trilogy. Yeah. Trilogy. Sorry. Um, but I sold in, uh, we sold in Illuminae, I think two books in, I think the second Lotus War book was out by the time that we pitched Illuminae, Amy and we being Amy and I, um, mm. and I was kind of also pitching them and I at the same time. So, mm. yep. Wow. So take us back. So for those who don't know what Storm Dancer or that particular trilogy is about, what's your, your elevator pitch, your 10 second elevator pitch for those who haven't yet picked it up? Uh, it was kind of uh, steampunk inspired by feudal Japan, the Tokugawa era, um, the era of the shoguns and samurai, basically. So it was kind of a, a marriage of those two concepts, mm. which I hadn't seen before. And it centers around a girl named Yukiko, uh, who has the ability to talk to animals, and she she ends up befriending uh, a griffin they're called thunder tigers in that world but they're essentially griffins because i like griffins they're one of my favorite mythical creatures um, and they kind of form a bond in that initial book and then shenanigans ensue after that so uh it, it's kind of hero girl and, and animal companion vibes <laughs> it's very cool now that was for the adult readership is that correct that's not ya uh, I, we, I find we, it in two different places sometimes. Yeah, we kind of pitched it as a crossover novel. Mm. Um, I mean, lengthwise, it's probably close to why I think the I think the first book is like one hundred and ten thousand words. Oh, um, God. <laughs> some of the yeah, it's pretty short by my standards now. Uh, but some of the subject matter was a little bit heavier than you found in your average why novel. So I think I think initially I pitched it as a why book. Mm -hmm. uh, but we ended up selling it to an adult imprint and it kind of got marketed as a crossover novel. Mm. Uh, and yeah, then after that, I kind of branched both ways. Like Illuminate was very firmly YA and Nemonite was, you know, it's, it's probably more adult than YA. You could pitch it as crossover as well. But again, I kind of kept on that heavier, darker theme track. I, I, I've read Never Night and I'm thinking that is definitely an adult book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, yeah. I, I was reading Stephen King when I was 10 and, you know. Oh, gosh. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, for a given value of okay. So I guess it depends on the maturity of the reader and everybody's their own best judge in that insofar mm -hmm. as that goes. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, it's certainly heavier uh, in places than your average YA novel anyway. Uh, I, I get readers sending me pictures of never night in the wire section all the time uh, i think they, they take pleasure in trolling me but yeah i'm kind of weird in that respect i've kind of had two feet uh, in either pond for a few years oh fair enough fair enough um i'd like to talk a little bit more about your books but we do have a question from karen stratton karen thanks for your question uh karen says hi jay is killing your creative babies why you feel so comfortable in killing off your characters <laughs> uh i don't yeah i don't know uh i i guess one of the fundamental principles i have when i write is that victory has to come with sacrifice victory without sacrifice is kind of meaningless uh and the example i used to illustrate this is star wars just you know i don't think star wars is the greatest thing ever written but everyone's probably seen it um in the first star wars movie luke kind of closes his eyes and pulls the trigger and blows up the Death Star and everyone mm. goes home and gets a medal. In the second movie, you know, he gets his hand cut off, his best friend gets kidnapped by 
uh, Boba Fett, and he finds out that the Spoilers. most evil man in the galaxy is his father. Uh, and, you know, the end of that film is a defeat, but the defeat mm. they suffer at the end of the second film makes the victory they achieve in the third one all that more satisfying. So, uh, yeah, characters getting killed is kind of part of that darkest moment before the dawn uh, that I enjoy mm. writing so much. I, I'm not sure what it is about me that that kind of drives me towards that kind of storytelling, but I always find it compelling when I'm watching a story like that. So it's the kind of story that I want to create when I'm creating my own. You've got the power. <laughs> That's what yeah. it is, I reckon. <laughs> and I, you know, I, 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 I like, yeah, I like tugging readers' heartstrings. I like uh, people sending me all caps tweets or pictures of them <laughs> crying weirdly enough. I, I like the idea that I can make you feel anything at all. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary that characters who only live in someone's head can make you feel anything, be it anger or, or joy or sadness or whatever. So, yeah, um, bumping off the level of side character is one of the ways to kick you in the feels. <laughs> well, well, nailing that in Illuminae, in, in the Illuminae files, um, I, I read that, and that's um, your collaboration with Amy Kaufman, of course. I, on, I, I said to Amy in the last conversation we had that I felt like a military general sifting through files, going through the, those books. <laughs> and I was like, I remember getting to one part of it, I was like, no! Why? Why? <laughs> but can yeah. you walk us through that collaboration? Was it was that your first ever collaboration for those who don't know? Was that your first? Yeah. And how did you find great. that going from solo to collab? Um weirdly enough, the job that I had that I was talking about before, uh, working as a creative in advertising agencies, typically you're paired up with another creative. Um the the pairing will be art director and copywriter. And I was initially an art director, so I was in charge of more the visual stylings than the writing side of things. Mm. But weirdly enough, that was a really good boot camp for working in a collaborative author relationship because you're basically two people sitting in a room all day throwing ideas back and forth and you learn very quickly to develop a thick skin and to take critique and not to fall in love with with your ideas because if you get precious about it, then egos get involved and you, you try to be as egoless as possible. So yeah. weirdly enough, that was a really good training ground for working collaboratively. Um, Amy had worked with her other co-author, Megan Spooner, before that, so mm -hmm. she was kind of more experienced in the collaborative space. But yeah, it, it was it was surprisingly easy given the background that I had in ads. So yeah, we, we kind of worked the same way. It, it, Illuminating was a weird project in the sense that we didn't really think it would sell. We thought it was just too weird. Um, so once we kind of worked out the framework of the book, we really just wrote it for ourselves because we thought it would just be too odd. The publishers wouldn't know what to make of it. But we were just having fun working on it. So we kind of wrote it like the world wasn't watching in a weird way. And no idea was too silly and no thought was too weird, which I think is how we found, found ourselves in that kind of experimental space in terms of writing and also integrating the graphics and stuff together. So it was it was a really amazing creative experience. Um, and that was really the books that kind of changed the course of Amy in my life. So yeah, very grateful. Coming up on the 10 year anniversary of that actually next year. Um, it blows my mind. That was my, uh, admittedly, that was my gateway to your work was Illuminate. And oh, was well, like, yeah, cool. has it really been 10 years, almost 10 years since I first met you both at Kino Kunir yeah. in the city on a lunch break? I remember that. Oh, wow. <laughs> I came on my lunch break to meet you both. And I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. And the, the, the book itself is not written like your average novel. So I'm very keen to know how you crafted that. Like, what was the idea behind that? Why was it written the way it was, is really what I want to know. Well, uh, I, Amy and I were buddies before we were collaborating together. So uh, our debuts kind of came out within, I think, seven or eight months of each other. Um, and so we got to be friends um, just because we were both authors living in Melbourne and we didn't really know many others. So we would just get together every month uh, and have brunch and talk about where we were at in the publication journey and what was happening, you know, this my editor used this word and I didn't understand what it meant the first time, but I was too embarrassed to ask. And now I'm too far along the chain to go back and ask. So what, what the hell is they talking about or whatever? So it was, yeah, it just kind of breakfast workshop meetings. And one day she came in and said that she had a dream that we wrote a book together. She couldn't remember what the book was about, but she remembered that it was written in email format. Um, and we thought that was a kind of interesting idea for a book. Uh, mm. And so we started kicking around 
what might that book actually look like? How could you write a book that consisted entirely of emails? And being nerds, we kind of stumbled into the sci-fi space and you know decided to incorporate text messages and medical reports and that kind of thing. But the real the real shift was when we came up with the concept for aid and the idea that the God's eye view was going to be a computer that could see everything, but it had been damaged and that damage changed the way it perceived and the way the text would kind of be arranged on the page. Mm. Uh, and that kind of tied back into my training. Like I said, I was an art director for lots and lots of years. So like, yeah, we, we kind of started playing with the idea of visuals and messing around with typography and evoking you know, what's happening in the text with the way the text would be arranged and uh, you know the ability to use Photoshop and InDesign and all that kind of stuff came in handy. Uh, I actually found we ha we have we have some news on the ten year anniversary for Illuminate, but I can't spoil anything yet. But I was going through a bunch of the old stuff uh, not so long ago, and I actually found the initial document that we sent out to publishers because we thought it was too weird to explain. So we mocked up like the first hundred and fifty pages. To give publishers a rough idea we figured if we could show them what we meant rather than tell them what we meant that might make it an easier sell so yeah i found that that 150 page doc that i bashed together on InDesign the other day uh, it's pretty different to what the final book ended up looking like but it, it was cool oh, well you'd have to include that in your 10-year edition like in snippets in the back like in a lecture or something <laughs> yeah we're, we're talking about it we're talking about it there's, oh, there's stuff going on gross. behind the scenes so yeah, yeah. It, it'll be interesting Oh, I can't wait. Well, you know what? Weird sells because that book has been published in other languages. And being Indonesian, I was very excited to get a Bahasa Indonesian edition of the yeah. I couldn't believe I found it. It's like, yeah, it sells. <laughs> it, it's well received in Indonesia. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, was the translation good? It's, it's yeah. always interesting. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I read the English version and I saw the Bahasa. And I'm like, yep, spot on. Loved it. Oh, amazing. It's good. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm going to speak a word. So, yeah. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Um, I but it's nice to hear that translation works. That's good. Yes, very cool. We have some questions coming through. So I just I want to make sure that we cover everyone today. So LT sent a question through. Thanks, LT. Uh, LT says, hi, Jay. I'm nearly finished my first dark fantasy book to self-publish. So my characters swear a lot. Would I include profanity in my list of trigger warnings or is that ridiculous of me? I swear a bit in real life, but others do not. It's a good question. Thank you, LT. It is a good question. I don't. I don't know if there's an absolute golden rule in that respect. Um, mm. I, I guess it depends on how how much you want your warnings to cover. Uh, I mean, I swear all the time, and I'm perfectly comfortable with it. Uh, I know some people aren't. I don't know if that would turn people off the book. Uh, mm. But yeah, I, I guess it's up to you. If you think it's important um, to warn people, then by all means do so. I don't. I don't think there's any rule against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you, you kind of set your own limits in so far as those warnings go. So yeah. Yeah. Um, as but it's amazing that you've... yeah. Oh, sorry. I was saying I've never seen a trigger warning for swearing, but usually themes. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you think about it logically. If you're watching a television program, um, you know, when warnings come up before a TV program, it will it will warn you about the use of coarse language. Uh, yeah. So I guess you know, television and movies consider it worthwhile flagging so if you want to then by all means do so i know some people get upset about swearing um, i get criticized for swearing too much i saw one person who made a compilation of every use of <laughs> it was hilarious. Oh, no. every use of the word fuck in empire of the vampire they took a photo of it and cut it together to music as like a critique and i thought that was the best ad for empire of the vampire i'd ever seen <laughs> Like that would make me buy the fucking book, but anyway, uh, yeah. So some people, some people get bent out of shape about it, I guess. So maybe it's worth flagging. Oh wow! I have to say that is one review I have never seen before. That that yeah. person's taken a lot of time to put that. It together. took a long time. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it would have been a lot of work. So thank you. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Before we get on to the next question, I wanted to cover a couple of other books that Jay has written. So we did discuss your collab with Amy with Illuminae Files, but you've also collaborated on Aurora. Can you tell us a bit about that one? Yeah, so we started kicking around ideas on Aurora after we'd written the second Illuminae Files book. Um, and yeah, we basically just made a list of everything that we loved. Amy and I are both kind of sci-fi nerds. We're both Trekkers as opposed to Star Wars fans. We're Star Trek fans. Um, 
And yeah, we, we just kind of made a list of all the things that we enjoyed most about sci-fi uh, and tried to melt them all into a cool melting pot. Um, we decided to go a little bit more traditional in terms of the way we wrote it. We didn't want to be, we didn't want to repeat ourselves in terms of the weird format of Illuminate. We didn't want to get pigeonholed into the two people who write, you know, the weird graphic novel type books. Um, so yeah, we, we moved into more traditional space in terms of the long form prose, but we include, I guess the weird thing we did in that book, I always try and do one weird thing, uh, was the Magellan entries. Um, so Magellan is, it's kind of our homage to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's like a Wikipedia in a, you know, on a tablet. Uh, and we used the Magellan entries to kind of quickly explain lore and world building aspects. We, you know, at the start of every chapter, there would be an entry about the alien race you're about to encounter or the city you're about to visit or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was ensemble cast. Uh, uh, we had seven characters in the original book. Um, so seven POVs, but one of them, Zila, who is a character, she, she's very quiet to begin with. So her character, her chapters were sometimes only one sentence long. So she doesn't really count as a POV character in the first book, at least she comes out of her shell in later books. But yeah, we divided up the labor in terms of characters. So we took three apiece. Um, I don't know if we've ever said who wrote what. I think we kept it a secret for a really long time. I don't know if we've ever actually confirmed or denied who wrote who. So I should keep quiet about that just in case I'm in the cat out of the bag. Um, yeah, but we had three characters each and um, we were a little bit more organized in terms of the plotting because with Illuminae, uh, when we were writing like the text message conversations, for example, we would go into a scene, we would know, okay, Katie and Ezra need to have a fight here. We wouldn't know quite what the fight was going to be about, but we would we would almost improvise. We were kind of role playing and just texting back and forth. Sometimes we're actually texting on phone and then transcribing the conversations into the novel. Um, and we got to know the characters kind of gradually um, because you were introduced to them one at a time, almost in isolation, whereas in Aurora, all of the main characters were in the same room by kind of chapter two or three. And we had to know how each of them spoke and each of them acted. And uh, so we basically did like D and D character sheets almost for each of them. Um, big spreadsheets listing out, you know, not only the physical attributes, but what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what makes them scared, what their dark secret is, what they don't want anyone else to know about them and their family and all that kind of stuff uh, and then for that first scene again we just improvised dialogue only we just sat down in a chat room and just wrote lines people speaking back and forth to each other to get each other into the heads and the tone of voice of each of the characters because you know very quickly i had to be writing the characters that Amy was the steward of. So I needed to know how they speak. I needed to know what their attitude was. I needed to know how their physicality worked. So yeah, that, that was an interesting evolution. Um, and in some ways it was a lot harder to do than Illuminate because Illuminate was quite narrow in scope to begin with. We got to know one or two characters really intimately because they were the focus, whereas an ensemble cast, it made things kind of bigger and harder, but still a lot of fun. I like those books a lot. I was going to say, it sounds very complex. It's like you're designing your own D&D game with, with your character arc sheets. <laughs> yeah, almost. Um, wow, very complex. How long did it take you guys to write this and to get it all together? Um, I mean, each book, I mean, it probably took about a year to write each one, but we would we would get together and plot out blocks of the book. Uh, we mm. found that if we... If we plotted too far ahead, we would inevitably think of a cooler idea and, and the plotting that we had done would mostly have to be rewritten. So we figured oh. out about 100 pages with our limit. Um, wow. 100 pages in advance, we would get together in the same space, yeah. uh, most often a pub. Uh, Amy doesn't drink, but she would watch me drink and then we would sit and kind of throw ideas back and forth, work out the 100 pages and then break those 100 pages into chapters and figure out who was the best POV to be telling that particular part of the story. And then we would each go away and write our respective pieces, kind of throw them back to each other. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was kind of a constantly evolving project. It was kind of like the, the shoemaker and the elves, you know, that fairy story yeah. of the and the elves, like yes. two lays out some leather in his store and the night before and wakes up in the morning and there's shoes there where there was only leather. <laughs> 
being a collaborator is kind of like that. Like you wake up in the morning and there's more book in your inbox. You didn't write it, but the book has suddenly gotten bigger. So. It's evolved. Yes. The L's have been at work. Yeah, <laughs> that's so. incredible. Like I've never, ever heard like the intricacies behind a collaboration. Like that's incredible. And we're definitely going to talk a little bit more about your solo work shortly, but I'd like to get some more questions to you. Yeah. Um, so we've got Anonymous on the line. Thank you, Anonymous. Um, Anonymous says, hey, Jay, uh, you mentioned a little about the planning of your books, particularly with the Lotus War series. Did you find you needed to research the concepts a lot for a firm grasp on them? And what was your process of planning how you would use such information? Uh, it, it, I think it depends what you're writing. Um, yeah, and it, and it depends on project to project. In terms of the process, uh, what I'll usually do is draw up a world building document first. Um, you know, the story has to always, in my opinion, come back to character. People don't fall in love with settings, they fall in love with characters. The character always comes first. But I find in the evolution of the world, uh, you know, the place that a character lives is naturally going to inform who they are and what their worldview is. So, uh, again, I'm a bit of a DD nerd. Uh, and I like the world building aspect of storytelling. So I will draw up kind of a master world building document, uh, break things down in terms of religion, politics, history, you know, what the core struggle in a society is on a societal level and a national level, uh, figure out what my character's place in that tableau is and kind of go from there. Um, but yeah, it, it, it depends on the project that you're working on and the kind of story that you're telling you know genre fiction is obviously a lot more intensive in terms of world building than writing something like romance or contemporary for example um so yeah it, it, it's a little bit driven by the individual project itself uh, mm -hmm. and the kind of story that you wanted to write so for example on illuminate we wanted to write a sci-fi story but we didn't want it to be hyper fantastical in terms of alien species um, and we wanted to keep faster than light travel limited. You can only do it from certain points. Whereas Aurora was a lot more um, soft in terms of science fiction terms. So you've got alien species, uh, you've got uh, faster than light travel, people can travel vast distances in the blink of an eye. Um, so, you know, the science in that was a lot softer than something like Illuminate was. We're always, I mean, we're always careful to kind of ground things in reality as far as physics go for example we have a astrophysicist friend of ours uh, who proof proofread all the illuminae and aurora books um, a lot of our a lot of our ideas about the way space works is informed by science fiction rather than science fact and so uh sana her name is sana she would uh, often go off on little tirades telling us that fire doesn't work this way in space and vacuum doesn't work this way in space and that kind of thing so which yeah we tried to keep everything grounded in as far as as far as the law of physics doesn't matter where you are in the galaxy the laws of physics are going to be the same but um yeah the the world building uh we had a little bit more latitude as far as being fantastical goes yeah and i think there is a certain responsibility as a writer that while you have creative license you do need to keep it grounded some some way um which is yeah uh, which really is true. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah and again this is all really important but i go back to that first point that character is still the most important element in any novel um you know mm -hmm. Some people can get carried away on the world building side of things and build these vastly intricate worlds, but no one falls in love with settings. People mm. fall in love with characters, you know, as, as wonderful a setting as something like A Song of Ice and Fire is. People don't talk about how great Westeros is, they talk about how great Arya Stark is or whoever. So it's the characters that still drive everything. That's the most mm. important part of being. 100%. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you there as a reader, definitely. And here's a question for you, Jay. Um, if you could branch out to another genre that you haven't yet tapped into, would would you and what would that be? You mentioned contemporary and romance. Would you ever try that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think I'd be bad at it. Um, I, I'm very envious of contemporary writers, actually. I don't, I don't quite know how they do it. Um, you know, when you're writing genre you can you know things get quiet you can you know, blow up a spaceship or throw a dragon in there <laughs> but you can't do that in a contemporary setting so um yeah it's it's not 
it's not something that I've studied the craft of at all. So I suspect <laughs> I would be really bad at it. Um, but genre is also my first love. Like it, it's what I read for fun. Uh, yeah. And I think most authors will gravitate towards the kind of books they love uh, and the kind of books they want to read. So in terms of what I would try that I haven't tried already, mm. uh, maybe true, maybe crime. True crime. I, do, I, I do enjoy a little bit of true crime. Oh, uh, brave! Yeah, but it's it's not it's not something that I would be good at. I don't think <laughs> I think I'll stick to what I know. <laughs> Wise move! <laughs> I can't do true crime. It's just too too real. It's just too real. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, my wife is more of a fan than I am, so I, I kind oh. of absorb a lot of it by osmosis. Um, oh. but, I, but I am fascinated by it. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think that would be good right. <laughs> it's like no, nope, I'm sticking to what I know. Yeah. <laughs> Very wise call. Um, the um, next question comes from Zoe Renee, and it's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you. Uh, thanks for your question, Zoe. Zoe would like to know how does it feel having probably the best opening line of any book, and then in brackets, E O T V, which is of course Empire of the Vamp uh, Empire of the Vampire. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's really nice of you to say. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, uh, yeah, opening lines are really hard uh, and they often, it's funny, I was having a conversation with this about, uh, about. I think there was an article that came out the other day saying that Harry Potter had the best opening line in history. I was sitting with a group of my writer friends and we all started throwing out first lines that we thought maybe were better. And one of the things that we noted in you know, each of us had, you know, five or six bangers that we could kind of recite off the top of our head. But usually the promise of the premise is written in that opening line. Uh, even if it's slightly obfuscated, you will get a sense of what the book is going to be by that by that cold open. So I try and do the same thing, I guess, but I, I did it more instinctually than actually sit it down and studying the craft of it. But mm. I like, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm proud of a couple of my opening lines, actually. The opening line of Nevernight kind of gives you a, exactly an idea of what kind of book that you're in for and i tried to make weirdly enough because i was writing way at the same time and i knew that some readers would come to nevernight through illuminate i wanted to let you know kind of straight away that you're not in YA country anymore so i, I tried yeah. to make that opening page a bit of a slap to the face to, to let you know that you're not <laughs> in this anymore um and yeah I, I tried to do the same thing with empire i guess trying to cover off what the theme of the book and the central core of the character was going to be in that opening page. But I'm really, I'm really glad. I think it was Zoe you said. Was yeah, Zoe really Renee, glad. yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> so speaking of Empire and your series there, there's some people who've yet to pick that up. Can you tell us a bit about what that is? Uh, so Empire of the Vampire is uh, kind of a dark epic fantasy. Uh, it's my latest book. It's about 800 pages long, so it's a bit of a doorstopper. Uh, and it is centered in a, a medieval fantasy world where the sun doesn't shine as brightly in the sky anymore. No one quite knows why. Uh, it stopped shining about 25 years ago as bright. There's still sun, but it's it's kind of like there's a pall over the sky. And in this world, vampires are real, and they figured out the sunlight no longer kills them. They can walk around freely during the day, and so vampires start popping up around this country. They've been living in secret for hundreds of years and they slowly start taking it over. And the story centers around a guy named Gabriel de Leon, who is part of a kind of a warrior monk brotherhood. Uh, they're called Silver Saints, they're monster hunters, but they're all half vampires themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and he starts the book in captivity uh, and he's been captured by a group of vampires and he's kind of charged with telling the story of his life. And the story is kind of split in two halves. One covers off when he's a young man and he's first recruited into the order. Mm -hmm. uh, he's only 16 years old, 15 years old, I think he starts out. And the second part of the book is when he's a much older man. Uh, he's kind of bitter and jaded. He's this fallen hero type who's uh, not not really the kind of man that the legends told about him co you know, correlate to. So he's dragged inadvertently into a quest to find the Holy Grail and maybe bring back the sun to the sky. So it's kind of young man, old man, and those paths, those storylines kind of intersect, interweave throughout the course of the entire novel. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end, you find out what made this young, idealistic, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed young man turn into this 
curmudgeonly drunk, uh, faithless <laughs> guy that you meet at the start of the book. So wow, well, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I, I think it's probably the best book that I've ever written. Um, and like I said before, I try and do something a little bit weird every time I write a novel. So uh, in Empire, the historian who's recording Gabriel's story is also an artiste, uh, and so he's sketching elements of the story as Gabriel is telling it. So uh, I used an Australian artist, her name's Bon Orthwick. She goes by the name Monolime online. She's got this amazing visual style and she does, she's done a bunch of illustrations uh, that I interspersed throughout the book. Um, and yeah, they're beautiful. She did a great job. Intriguing and incredible. Thank you so much. Wow, you've got a lot of questions. So I'm going to try and make sure we go through them as well. Yeah, sure. Um, anonymous, we've got Anonymous back again, uh, says, Hi, Jay, what would be the ultimate achievement for your books and your career as a whole? Um, I don't know if there's a good answer to that question. I'm kind of one of those people that are, I don't know if enough would ever be enough. There's always another mountain to climb. Um, that's one of the reasons why you probably shouldn't compare your success to other people's because there's always someone doing bigger or better. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to be where I am. I get to write genre fiction for a living as an Australian. That's really hard to do. There's not many of us who get to do that. Um, you know, I get to travel all over the world and meet people in countries whose language I don't even speak who have read my stories and my characters and uh, fallen in love with them and had their lives changed by them. So I don't know. I, I'm doing pretty goddamn amazing um yeah i'm very lucky to get to do what i do for a living uh, and i'm incredibly grateful to the readers who let me do it i'm fully cognizant of the fact that i couldn't do this without all of you so everyone out there who takes the time to read my books and tell their friends and do you know youtube reports or tiktoks or instagrams or whatever anyone who's out there spreading the word about my stuff thank you very much because yeah I, I couldn't do this without you and uh, I wouldn't want to do anything else. So, yeah, I truly appreciate everything you do. But, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, a TV show would be awesome, I guess, <laughs> if, I, if I was going to. Well, we're partway there. <laughs> we're partway there. Nevernight had been uh, filmed, adapted to film. Yeah. Pierre, we're partway there, yes. Did an amazing job of that, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nevernight. who don't know, there's a web series done by Pierre Ford, who is an Australian filmmaker, uh, and they're up on YouTube right now, and, yeah, those guys did an amazing job. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm constantly blown away. I actually went back and watched them just the other day. Uh, yeah, they did an incredible job pulling it all together. So fantastic! Yeah, I've seen it. it was, it's really good. I even DM'd Pierre. I was like, "Wow!" <laughs> That's all I could she say was, "Wow!" Yeah. She's, yeah. she's an amazing creator. Uh, yeah, fantastic. supremely talented lady. So yeah, I'm very fortunate. Very cool. Yeah, so we're part way there. So producers, listen up. <laughs> More to come. Sure. sure. <laughs> Uh, Katrina Purvis, thank you very much for your question. Uh, Katrina says, hi, Jay. How did you end up working with Bon Orthwick? Um, it was it was kind of, it was through the fan art scene. Um, so never not got a bunch of fan art. Um, my, the walls of my study are kind of covered in it. I don't know if you can you can see a bunch oh, of wow. the place. But, uh, Shelf envy right yeah, here. That picture <laughs> right there. Yeah um bond sent me back in 2019 um just when she was kind of getting into the fan art scene uh, she sent it to me it was one of the first pieces of fan art that i got but her style was just unique it, she, she doesn't look like anyone else's style out there um and so when i was tossing around the idea for empire and decided that i was going to get an illustrator involved uh, she was one of the first people that i thought of uh weirdly enough it turns out that she was an australian i had no idea if she was an aussie uh, and she lived just down the road from me for a really long time. She's she's moved back to South Australia now. But weirdly enough, when we started working together, we had no idea, but she was 20 minutes down the road from me. Um, so, yeah, we would get together and, and shoot the breeze at the pub and whatever else. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I got involved through – I found out about her through fan art, um, and I figured when I started – when I – decided that i was going to use illustrations i wanted to use someone from the fan art community i wanted to give somebody a look in and a leg up because i know it can be really hard to break into a creative endeavor no matter what that is whether it be mm. writing or illustration or film or whatever um you need people to take a chance on you so i wanted to give back to the fan art community um because like i say my walls are covered in it I, I get amazing stuff sent to me all the time um so yeah i wanted to 
try and give somebody a leg up and she's been amazing like just incredible to work with she's super professional and um she throws in her own ideas as well it's not just me telling someone what to do she it's kind of a collaboration she'll throw in her own thoughts and Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah it, it's it's a really amazing experience and can't wait for you all to see the stuff that she's done on uh empire of the Damned because she's really outdone herself like she's just an incredibly talented lady and i'm very lucky to work with her fantastic no, definitely keep an eye out for that everyone i can't wait will that be on socials that stuff uh i've started spoiling some yeah i'm, I'm okay. doing one a month on my instagram so i just did the third one i think um I haven't posted it in its entirety, but if you look at my Instagram feed, yeah. like the entire feed, you can kind of see the, the 12 parts making up the full picture. But yeah, I'm spoiling one picture a month. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Laura Everett has a question. So Laura says, hey, Jay, if when you do another book tour, would you do any pit stops in more rural cities? My town has an incredible little bookstore and I would freak the fudge out if you came here. <laughs> quote <laughs> uh it, it that kind of thing depends on my publisher and it often depends mm. on budget and time as well uh i would love to do more rural stuff but it it just depends um the tour for damned is going to be pretty hectic uh we're going to try and get some australian appearances but i'm going to be i'll probably do three and it, it'll be the usual ones maybe brizzy sydney and melbourne and then i have to bounce straight to the uk for the launch over there I'm there in the UK for like seven days and then I have to bounce to America and do the launch there. So it's going to be pretty hectic, unfortunately. So I don't know if I'll have a lot of time to see rural Australia, but I would really like to one day, hopefully. Yes, yeah, so we'll petition the publishers, hopefully. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <For that. laughs> Definitely. Um, the question that came from Anonymous just now, I think we've answered if there was any other qu uh, genres outside of uh, sci-fi and fantasy you were interested in writing in. You mentioned true crime earlier. <laughs> Or crime, yeah. Or uh, crime, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in those genres and I enjoy them, but like I say, I don't think I'd be very good at them. I'd, <laughs> it'd be, never it'd say pretty, never. No, no, but it'd be pretty egotistical to think just because I can write a sci-fi book that I can write a true crime book. So yeah, I think I'll probably <laughs> stick to what I know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, we had another question. Hi, Jay. Evidently, not all of your works are written from a perspective that you have experience in. What was it like trying to put yourself in the mindset of those characters? And do you worry that something you've written might offend? I mean, <sighs> writing is an exercise in empathy and imagination. Uh, no matter what you're writing, unless you're writing a biography, you're putting yourself in the position of somebody else. You know, I've never been a soldier. I've never been in a frontline combat position. I've never asked someone to put their life in my hand and uh, have them ask the same of me. Uh, I've never, I've never killed anybody. Uh, <laughs> Good to know. Anybody. I've never ridden on the back of a griffin. I've never been in a spaceship. Uh, you know. All of the characters I write are almost completely disconnected from me as a person. But human beings are, by their nature, driven by the same forces, uh, love and pursuit of joy and anger and fear. You know, no matter what, who you're writing, there are points of commonality in human nature that you can hopefully gravitate towards and make your characters compelling enough that people see something in them. You know, mm -hmm. I've never been teenage female assassin girl uh, but a lot of people still found Mia to be a compelling and convincing character mm -hmm. um, so yeah I, I i try and root my characters in points of commonality that all human beings feel you know Mia is an exploration of the destructive nature of revenge uh and an exploration in the concept of fear uh, what it would be like to be fearless and live life without fear and what how that would change your worldview and what kind of person you might become uh, and how ultimately fear is an essential part of being alive. It's kind of a lesson mm. you learns over the course of three books. Gabe is an exploration in faith and loss thereof, um, an exploration of the, the pitfalls of orthodox religion and how uh, it can lead to dissatisfaction in your view of the world, but how nihilism uh, and faithlessness is ultimately destructive and how it doesn't matter what you believe in but you have to believe in something so you know the, those are ideas that are grounded in a in a broader sense of humanity 
and those are the core tenets of those characters that I'm exploring in those books. Um, but yeah, you know, I've never been a vampire hunter. I've never been a female teenage assassin. I've never been a computer hacker. I've never been a space pilot. <laughs> so, you know, when you're writing genre in particular, um, you know, you have to exercise the imagination uh, and ground your characters in the empathetic uh, and mm. look for what unites us all as human beings, no matter what the setting, whether it's, you know, a world with no sun and vampires running around or a world where the sun is out all the time and you never get sleep or whatever that may be. In terms of in terms of worrying about offending people, no. Um, particularly in this day and age, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, someone online is going to be upset about it and they will probably take the time to let you know. That's what people who spend a lot of time online seem to do. Yep. Um, so, no, it's not something that you can worry about. You have mm. to tell the story that you want to tell uh, as best as you can stay as true to your vision as you can and then throw it out into the world and hopefully the world loves it. Uh, not everyone in the world will, but hopefully whatever you're doing will find an audience and you go from there. Uh, otherwise, if you spend your time worrying about what everyone will think and trying to make everyone happy, you probably won't ever do anything because you'll be <laughs> paralyzed. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The story won't get written. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, Nothing yeah. will get written if you worry too much. That's for sure. Yeah, very wise words, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's impossible to please everybody. Um, oh. So, yeah, yeah, be as true to your story as you can, and try and write the book that you would want to read, uh, and hopefully mm -hmm. find this audience. Hundred percent. Now, couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. Cat McDermott would like to know how you manage your day to day schedule. <laughs> very busy, from what I hear. <laughs> um i mean it's basically writing is my full-time job now so i try and treat it like a job um mm -hmm. i try and get to my desk and start work uh, so at the moment i'm drafting i'm working on empire 3 uh, and so i'll try and be at my desk and at work by 10 o'clock i start the day by reading everything that i wrote the day before and kind of editing it and um you know uh, distilling it down get rid of the extraneous uh solidify what i was trying to achieve and then i will write my new set of words for the day. I try and get 3,000 words done every day. Uh, sometimes I don't succeed at that, but that's kind of the goal. That's the target that I set myself. You know, you know, if I'm writing something that's like an action scene, I tend to write those a lot faster than something that's more heavily dialogue driven. Dialogue takes me longer to write. So, But I set myself that goal and I do my best to hit it every day. If you write 3,000 words every day for you know five months, you've got yourself a fantasy novel. So. Uh, but I try not to edit as I go. I will just kind of write almost stream of consciousness. And like I say, when I start the next day, that's when I go back and edit what I wrote the day before. So first half of the day is editing, the second half of the day is drafting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try and knock off work by kind of six o'clock. Um, and yeah, so in that sense, it's, it, it is my day job. I kind of do it every day. It doesn't matter whether I feel like writing uh i'd still sit my ass in the chair and put the words down if i was working a regular job it doesn't matter if i don't feel like going to do it if i don't do my job i get fired so mm -hmm. i try and approach even though it's an amazing job and a creative job i try and approach it with the same sense of discipline that i would be if i was working just a regular job um because you know i have deadlines i have editors and contracts and and readers who are waiting for the next thing so uh, <laughs> you know even on days when you don't feel like doing it uh, I still put my butt in the chair and get the words down. That's the most important thing. If the words are bad, you can fix them. Uh, if the words don't exist, you can't do anything. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of the mindset. I I write six days a week. Uh, usually, I take Sundays off. I'll do a little bit of admin, but uh, yeah, I try and take one day off a week at least. But yeah, six days a week is kind of my job. Wow, an intense job, but <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing job. Training the brain all the time, stretching the brain all the time. Yes, and yeah. you're you're right about one thing because the readers always want more from Jay Christoph. And anonymous would like to know: it might be too early, but is Australia getting any special editions of Empire of the Damned? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say. I'll, I'll say, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> it's, oh, yay! Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we release uh, the cover for that next month. Uh, October is kind of we're dropping all of the special editions that we haven't yet spoiled. Um, mm -hmm. we had a, you know, it wasn't initially planned to do one in Australia, but you know, Empire of the Vampire was the first special edition that I ever got in Australia. I was very proud of that, given that I come from here. I figure I should look after you know 
my own country, men and women, before I look after anyone else. So yeah. I kind of went into bat for a special edition for Damned uh, and I got my way, which is nice. So, yeah, the cover for that is getting uh, released in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and it'll be out through the awesome folks at Dimix. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And you heard it here first, everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very Sorry, exciting. I wasn't allowed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're going to tell everyone for real. You know, I was going to say, we're going to know anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Our final question comes from another anonymous. Hello, hello. With Empire of the Dam, will there be a pre order bonuses like uh, when Empire of the Vampire came out? Thank you. Still very excited to, for the release, regardless. So, we did mention there's a special edition, but will there be swag? I think is the question and bonuses. Yeah, there is. Um, well, I think we're releasing the details for that later this month as well um it will depend on where you order it from but yeah i think i think there's going to be prints i think there's going to be a tote bag maybe Ooh. um and i believe that the special editions through Dimix are all going to be signed as well um i might be talking out of school there but i have a feeling they're all going to be signed but yeah um we will have details on all the special editions and all the yeah. special offers and pre-order stuff uh october is kind of the month where all that stuff gets spoiled but short answer, yes, yes, there will be, there will okay. be loose. Fantastic. Well, we're on the 1st of October today, so not long to go. All the information will be coming out very soon. Um, the, well, I want to thank all the participants for, for being here for all your amazing questions and wonderful comments. Um, we are starting to come to the end of our panel, unfortunately. Jay, I could talk to you all day. It's amazing to talk to you. Uh, one you book we haven't discussed was Lifelike. Tell I'm us sure about about Lifelike. Sure <laughs> please, please, let's 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 because we, we covered all of your books, but there was one that we hadn't touched. Life like, tell us about that one. Uh, so that is a young adult science fiction post apocalyptic uh, Mad Max Fury Road meets Romeo and Juliet type story. Um, so yeah, that was my solo YA series. Uh, yeah, post apocalyptic, it's set in uh, yeah, a post collapse America. It, it's, it's hero is a girl named Eve who lives in basically the massive junk pile that California has become, uh, and she fights robots. She builds robots uh, and fights them for a living. Uh, there's a group of they're kind of artificial humanoids called lifelikes. There was a kind of robotic rebellion a few years ago, the details of which are a little bit sketchy, and after that rebellion, they kind of got outlawed. Uh, and she finds the wreckage of one on the scrap pile where she lives and shenanigans kind of ensue. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's kind of a cross between Fury Road and Romeo and Juliet, I guess. Oh, well, there's your um, romance yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it, 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 there probably is more romance in that book than most of the ones that I write. Um, but, yeah, it's still, it's still me, so it's still kind of high action, high octane type stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of fun to write, but... Yeah, it, it's kind of a redheaded stepchild. It gets it gets overshadowed by everything else, which is fine. Everybody, I, don't know, I was just like everyody was talking about the other stuff. It's like no, life like we have a soft spot for life like we must cover it. Of course. Yeah, I just came out <laughs> in Spain uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm actually over in Spain in November for a couple of book festivals, and it's just dropped in Spain. Uh, so people over there are discovering it for the first time, which is pretty cool. Fantastic, very cool. To ask you a very controversial question to close us out today: Is there a favorite? Of all the books Jay Christoph has right, is there a favourite? It is like asking you who's your favourite child, I know. It is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's really hard. Um, I have lots of favourites. I think the best book that I've ever written is Empire, Empire of the Vampire. Um, I can kind of see how everything that I had written up to that point led to that book. Um, but I have a super soft spot for Illuminae. That was kind of the book that let me quit my day job. Wow. Um, I have a super spot, soft spot for Navanite. That was kind of the book that let me stay quit of my day job. That, and, it, and it was kind of an underdog story. Like no one thought that book was ever going to do anything. It was the mm. smallest advance I ever got paid for a novel. Um, mm. No one expected great things from it. I got a, actually accidentally got CC'd on a conversation from the sales department of my publisher. And they were outlining yeah, how how little they expected it to sell which is which was an interesting email to receive uh and despite all the odds it kind of found an audience uh and through you know the just the spread of the about the book online um thanks in no small part to people like piera um mm -hmm. kaz at little book owl who kind of became early evangelists mm -hmm. for the series 
it, it just kind of broke out through word of mouth uh, and just got yeah. passed among friends and friend groups online and went on to become this massive bestseller. And I think it's outsold any other series that I've ever written at this point. So yeah. I, I, I have a soft spot for that because it was kind of an underdog and everyone likes an underdog story. So I have, I have lots of faves, I guess, um, for different reasons. Uh, and yeah, but in, te- in terms of my fave, I mean, any author is probably going to tell you that the thing that they're working on right now is their fave because that's the thing that you know, yeah. is, people will tell you. Uh, but yeah, I do think Empire is the best book that I've written uh, and I do have a super soft spot for it. So yeah. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Not so controversial after all. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. It is hard though. It is, it is like It that. is difficult. Yes, yeah, yes. Like because you, you love your work for different reasons. And I'm yeah. pretty sure the readership is very much the same. Uh, look, you received a lot of love and thanks from the, the readership that had attended today. So um, yes, Jess M, thank you so much. No question, just immense love for Janie's work. And thank you very much for being here. And on behalf of Book Fair Australia, I would like to thank you for sharing your time with us today, this long weekend. Thank you so much for sharing your craft. And of course, your books we cannot wait for the next time we see you and for the next book release thank you so yeah, much amazing. well thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me it was good to see you again Likewise. Uh, and hopefully we'll see each other in the real in march when i get up uh, your way yes uh, but yeah thanks for taking the time today and uh, thanks for everything you guys are doing to promote uh you know the book scene in australia i, I know it's a lot of hard work and you guys are doing an awesome job so oh, all of us is- half of every author i'm sure i can say thank you so much it is such a pleasure and an absolute honor to be part of Book Fair Australia and just to see how far it's come in only 12 months. And um, the idea came from our CEO and director, Ivana Triglio, um, who I'd like to give a shout out to, uh, who had the very idea being in a convention as a, as a published author saying, I would love to see a con, but just books. And here we are. And we've got virtual as well as in person. So once again, everyone, thank you very much for being here. 14th and 15th October, 2023 is Book Fair Australia at Sydney. Olympic Park. Tickets are still available online. If you'd like to get yourself a ticket, please come down and join us. Yours truly will be emceeing that weekend. Um, But unfortunately, Jay couldn't join us in person, which is why he's with us today. And Jay, once again, thank you so much for being here. I hope you had a good time. I did, mate. Thanks very much. It was great to speak to you again. I'll see you. you. I cannot wait to see you again. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.